and welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation video podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onyea, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a WeBank certified life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase the importance of science advocacy, health equity, and influential leadership through conversations with senior life science leaders who share a unique leadership journey corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Dr. Mustafa Analoui, the Executive Director of Venture Development and Technology Incubation Program, TIP, at UConn, my alma mater. By coupling UConn's world-class research resources, facilities, and business support services to a network of experienced investors and entrepreneurs, UConn's TIP helps launch startups ready to transform their respective markets. Mustafa and I connected in person pre-pandemic at a 2019 venture clash in New Haven, hosted by Connecticut Innovations. And we stayed in touch via LinkedIn where we have over 1,100 mutual connections. And moreover, as a Yukon alumna and Yale entrepreneur in residence, I am really keen to find out more about how Mustafa is exploring the broad range of investment vehicles available to life science innovators in the Connecticut area and beyond. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the show, Mustafa. Thank you very much, Sophia. It's very kind of you. (laughs) You're welcome. So my first question to me, it's probably, I guess, the most important, at least in my opinion, which is, what is your definition of scientific innovation? Very good question. Uh, And I I have thought about this question for quite some time in my own professional career, both early on as a scientist, later on as investors and manager. And in my view, there is a general misunderstanding about what is innovation. And the most common misunderstanding is innovation is about quantum leap, creating uh, something that nobody has seen before. which is, I would say, a very small subset of what is innovation. To me, a scientific innovation is using existing tools, knowledge, and perhaps creating new tools and knowledge to solve a problem. So innovation could be a combination of existing tools that we have. Nevertheless, it's intended to have some implication. So to, to summarize this, it would be a novelty of tools and knowledge that will is intended to create some kind of impact. Right. Uh, impact to be very broad in, in this definition. Right, and we go from known to unknown, right? So I like what you emphasize. We have to start somewhere, but ultimately it's about impact. So thank yeah. you for that uh, great uh, definition. Um, My follow-on question for you, obviously based in your current role as Executive Director of Venture Development and Technology Incubation Program at UConn, what is your investment philosophy philosophy for startups and incubation? We we make two sets of investments. Uh, One is investment in people and investment in companies. What I mean by investment in people is mainly students and younger entrepreneurs. Hmm. We invest our time and resources and financial tools that we have, and it's heavily intended to educate and train them, not necessarily leading to a financial return on investment for us. It could lead to a lot of return for a broader community for that person. Hmm. The second category would be investment in the companies, the startups. That is intended to be a classical investment in a sense that if you're putting some money in, is this team capable of delivering what they are promising? Will there be a market for them and the timeline, deliverables, all that stuff? And the general metric for that kind of investment is financial return on investment. Right. Right. And has that philosophy evolved in the past few years amid the pandemic, or is that really just the same, really? I think the the general framework is the same. Right. The implementation of that changed because of pandemic. 
Mm -hmm. the, the attention has shifted to areas that are more important to us now compared to two years ago. Mm -hmm. But investment in people versus investment in the startups still remains as the cornerstone of thinking for me. Wow, that, that's really remarkable. I think that the, the students, the young innovators at UConn are really lucky to have a leader with that type of investment philosophy. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that. My follow-on question for you is, of all the companies that you have spun off at TIP, who might you consider to be the top three in terms of innovation and overall impact? And I know it's like picking your favorite child, but I just uh, might have a first that, uh, bear, Sophia, bear in mind that as of today, we have more than 70, that's seven zero companies. Right. And picking one out of 70 is quite challenging. Three. Vast, the vast majority of our companies would fit into life sciences, therapeutics, okay. medical devices, diagnostics, and digital services. But within that group of companies, there is one called Lambda Vision, uh, mm -hmm. co-founded by Nicole Wagner. Mm -hmm. And they, they are one of the most exciting companies in our portfolio for two reasons. Uh, one is the focus is restoring vision for certain categories of patients that they have lost their vision. They intend this restoring that. So this, this is a game changing idea. The second reason is their approach is very different than other approaches in the market, which makes it both promising as well as risky. So in, in terms of the top company that comes in my mind, but for the second and the third category, instead of picking a single company, I would say that a category of companies uh, that we have a number of them, and that would be mental health. Companies that are dealing with various aspects of mental health uh, addiction, and we have quite a number of them, young as well as adults. That would be the second group. And the last one would be uh, companies that are using really outstanding tools for societal impact, social impact, not necessarily developing a gadgets or a medical device or therapeutics, but creating products and solution that improve quality of people as a society. Wow. I mean, thank you for sharing that. Nicole is absolutely brilliant. I met her a few times, actually, at some Connecticut-related events. And I think the focus on mental health is one that is not just timely, but is really relevant. And, and also thinking about overall quality of life, that is something that is just as important. And uh, it fits in nicely to my next question for you. Um, obviously, I love Connecticut, it's, and I also recognize, as many do, that it's growing as a leading biotech cluster. So how is TIP exploring the broad range of investments that we spoke about earlier that is available to life science innovators to ensure a greater representation of minorities and, and women-led biotech companies? Um, diversity and inclusion is one of the critical factors that we consider when we hire the staff for the incubator, when we hire executives in residence EIRs to come and join us, as well as recruiting uh, the companies that we have. Right now, I am sitting in Stanford, Connecticut. That is the most recent location added to the incubators. And one of the topics that we have on a regular basis when we looking to new companies coming in is making sure that we actively pursue a diverse group of uh, founders and groups to come in. And to me, diversity is a, is a very broad range of attributes. It's not all about you know, one or two parameters. Um, there is ample evidence showing that a diverse group of people tend to be more productive Mm -hmm. tend to work together better and creating in a, in a much healthier environment for themselves as well as people around them. 
Well, again, extremely well said. I, as you were speaking, I was thinking about diversity of thought um, because when you bring together different people that have different backgrounds and such, you're able to elevate and advance the state of science, right? So thank you for integrating that, not just with your investment philosophies, but also looking at, at TIP as an organization to ensure that you have a pretty diverse mix of, of colleagues working in there. And so my next question for you, and I think it's an important one uh, for our audience, is what advice will you have for young scientists who are looking to launch their first startup? Ah, that's a good one. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, we, we have a workshop, actually, that we designed for young scientists. Uh, it's a unique workshop that it's by invitation that we go and find you because of your innovation, your publications, your patent or market demand. Uh, it's a one day workshop. We tell them you're not going to become entrepreneur overnight. But one thing that I heavily stress with the content that we provide as a team to them is entrepreneurship is different than the, that glamorous picture that are depicted in public. It's a very tough journey. And uh, there is a lot of heartbreak, ups and downs, especially in the biotech side. You can see that the chance of failure is much higher than success. So I want to be honest with these young entrepreneurs saying that they understand what they're getting into. But once they, they understood and they're committed, the second piece of advice I have for them is the value of the team, no matter how smart you are or how knowledgeable you are, to execute the plan, especially in biotech. You need a team. You need a diverse team in terms of scientific expertise, operational expertise, and a dynamic team as your ideas and products go to different stages of development. You know, you need to have this kind of interaction with different variety of players. So these are two things, again, I don't want to go through the laundry list, uh, reminding them this is a challenging journey and you have to be prepared for that. And the second piece, the value of developing a team mm -hmm. for developing your ideas. Yeah, I think that's really great sound advice that is ties back to what you were talking about when you define scientific innovation, right? So you have to think about impact, you have to think about continuity in, in, in innovation, and it starts with that sort of scrappy mentality, like entrepreneurship is not easy, but you have to be kind to people, treat your team well, value people, and it will come back in great returns for you. So thank you for sharing that perspective. Sure. Uh, so I'm curious now about you personally, uh, as an individual and as a leader, are there any notable mentors that have helped to shape your career journey to date? I think that the, the other side of that question is notable person that impacted my views, my, my life journey, mm -hmm. and notable events. Mm -hmm. There are so many people, so many things that impacted where I am, what I do. And it's hard to say for me, other than the parents, <laughs> that there was a single individual that because of that person, I, I am where I am. But net effect is I learned so much from so many people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people that you don't expect to be educating you because you know I used to be a professor, I teach students, but I learned so much from my own students as well as my own kids in the way looking at things and looking differently and collectively these pieces of uh, information has been extremely helpful to me. So I, I gave you a very long winded answer <laughs> saying, I don't know, uh, but as I said, the net effect is it comes from so many different direction and oftentimes from unexpected sources. To, to give you one specific example, when my kids were younger, as a parent, I was coaching various sporting activities they were in, from girls' soccer to boys' basketball. Um, I was supposed to teach them. They were fifth grader and middle schoolers when I did that. 
But I was amazed how much I learned from them by just observing them, how they react to me, how they interact with each other, and how they take a message and developing into action. Hmm. That was really, really educational for me. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that that story. I think that knowledge is so universal and you could learn from anyone, really. And I think for me personally, I'm a new mother. I had a baby six months ago and I have learned so much from my little child, Liam, about how to be mindful and how to be present. I think sometimes we're so busy with all these different things that we have going on that we missed out on the opportunity to really take in that moment. Yeah, what, what you will learn that raising a child, the learning involved in it, you will be qualified for two more PhDs. <laughs> well, that, that is the spirit. Now, as we begin to wrap up, I'm curious to know what you think are some key factors that will be important for sustaining innovation in the life science industry. Uh, Life science industry, again, is a, such a broad a range of topics, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Think about the pandemics that we are in. And uh, the big pharma, which was the evil character in the yeah. life sciences, and now suddenly they are becoming the, the cool again. Uh, yeah. So it, it's quite challenging, but I, I think... The life sciences, therapeutics, medical devices, diagnostics will move on, they get better. But to me, the emerging pattern is the integrated approach to the, the health and well being. Right now, we have a company that develops drugs, the other one develops diagnostics or implants, all that stuff. But eventually we get to a point that you have to look at the patient holistically mm -hmm. and the future life science companies, future I mean at least 20 years from now, would be the ones that will develop those kind of solutions. If I borrow the examples from computer industry, mm -hmm. uh, if you go back to 70s and 80s, there were companies that were good in creating pieces of the components of a, a computer hardware. Uh, and when you fast forward, companies such as IBM that invented PCB became integrator of technologies rather than getting pieces from different areas and creating an integrated solution. And to me, the integration would be the next frontier in life sciences uh, as a whole. Yeah, I, I think we're already seeing so much of that already, as you alluded to, and this idea of the data-enabled patient that has access to so much information, and how do you tap into that patient knowledge to design technologies and therapeutics that are best for the patient is the point that you made earlier around patient-centric care. So thank you for bringing it all back together once again. And my final question is the easiest one. Uh, do you have any other comments or thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap today? No, nothing special. I want to thank you for taking these initiatives and sharing the ideas within your network. And I want to congratulate you too for being a mom. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's such an engaging uh, conversation, but it's also a remarkable time in my life as well. And um, Grateful to people like you for supporting my journey as an entrepreneur, as a woman, and all the good things that come from all of that. So thank you again for the generosity of your time today. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.